remembers her mom taking her to the zoo when she was very young to see this rare bird, the white stork. And now she is actually monitoring a growing stork population in her hometown. These storks were basically extinct in her area, and now the numbers have grown fantastically um, to about 1,600 breeding pairs in the Netherlands. So that's a very good success story, and we're really looking forward to hearing your talk about these very special storks. Caroline, over to you. Thank you very much for this great introduction. I feel very honored to be on the other side of the screen now presenting about the white storks. Well, after a few hiccups, we are here from the Netherlands about the Dutch white storks, the roller coaster life of the Dutch white storks. Well, once upon a time, there was this little girl. And she was crazy about birds and she looked the birds up in the bird book and there she finds the white stork. And she asked her mother, where is this stork? But unfortunately, the storks were extinct uh, when she was little. You can see from the graphic in the right that um, the storks were not doing very well. The reasons why the storks were almost extinct in the 60s and 70s is um, the major cause is the habitat loss. After the war, the population was growing, the human population was growing, so there were a lot of mouths to feed. So a lot of habitat was turned into to agriculture. They lowered the groundwater level for the machines to work on the lands. And people started to use a lot of pesticides, especially DDT, because people do, did not want the bugs in their food. But these poisoned uh, animals were eaten by a lot of birds, also by the storks. And the, because of the poison, the storks died and the population dropped. There were just a few breeding pairs left, but to see this stork, I had to go to the zoo as a little girl to see this beautiful bird. Then uh, the bird life, the Netherlands started a reintroduction program. Storks were brought from Swiss and from Spain and the young chicks were eventually released in habitats where the stork used to be active. And you can see that the stork wants and needs uh, fresh water um, so you see that a lot of the storks uh, are around uh, rivers uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, together with the reintroduction program, also the habitat was being restored. When we think about this stork, we think about mainly the white stork, because we recognize it as a symbol I think everybody knows that it brings babies, it stands for luck. But there are over, there are 20 species of stork in the world. Here in the Netherlands, we only have the white stork breeding, and now and then we get a visitor that is the black stork. But a lot of different stork species are found in Africa and in the eastern part of the world also some in America and in South America. But this talk is about the white stork. And why is it that I am interested in this bird especially? That is because I was born and raised in the city De Haag. And the coat of arms of De Haag is this white stork. So probably I already saw this stork as a little girl maybe on um, advertisements or uh, in papers. And that's why I was attracted to this bird. Also, some other uh, cities have the coat of arms, the, the white stork, and it is the national bird of Ukraine. 
and of course the symbol that it stands uh, for luck. Uh, that mainly has to do that uh, the stork returns from the migration and people associate the stork with spring and prosperity. It goes back a long time that uh, the stork was um, around uh, settlements. Here you see a painting of the 17th and 18th century, the golden century, and even on those paintings, the storks are well represented. Also, together with humans, with settlements. It probably has to do with the fact that where there are people, there is farmland, so there is food av av available. But these storks are scavengers, so they are also very interested in the waste we produce. That's still the case nowadays. Also, with our high buildings, we provide a nice, solid place, a high place to nest. And of course, the city is warmer than the other areas around. So that are probably the main reasons why the storks are always um, associated with humans. So it's not a bird that you have to go and look for deep down in the bushes or a bird that nests in a, in a cave. It nests open and it's a bird that you can see quite easily. And it was an employee in The Hague. Because in the nine, before the 1900s, there was a fish market. And of course, nobody wanted to clean the fish market afterwards. So they hired a few storks. They put them in an aviary. And when the fish market was done, it was the job of these storks to clean up. And then there was uh, the, in, the new inventions like soap and machines to clean. So the bird was fired and now it's not on the market anymore. But it is still in The Hague. And you can see on the screen uh, where the Netherlands is based. And you can see on the star on the left side where The Hague is. It's near the beach. It also has a lot of um, agriculture areas around. And you can see that the storks nest near these areas. So they do not nest in the city center because there is not enough food available for them there. But you can see the population, the breeding population is in the north and a little bit in the south of The Hague. We have about 23 nests here in uh, The Hague, and I will tell you a bit more about them. Well, this is the traditional nest, the nest that everybody recognizes from books, a high place and a platform for the storks to nest. But in the city, we have the urban storks, and they just look around and find their own place, like chimneys, um, electricity poles, uh, other platforms, but they also nest in trees. We see that the storks nowadays are also attracted, more attracted to, uh, to the trees. Well, here is an example of how it looks. So it's just a street in the north of The Hague and the stork nests on this chimney. You can see the chicks also looking down on the street. But this is, an, this is the other view taken from above. And there you can see that they not just see uh, the city, but beyond the city, there's the land where they can find food. And this is a perfect place because the storks, they need to defend their nest and their chicks. So what they prefer is that when one of the birds, one of the adult birds goes foraging, 
The other bird is on the nest, defending the nest. But when they have to take turns, it saves a lot of time that you see where your mate has been and where the mate has found the food. They have very good eyes, so when they take turns, it's very easy to recognize where there is food avail available. This is March, and the storks are starting their courtship. And, uh, and they cannot, we just had a talk about uh, bird song, but uh, the storks, they cannot sing. Instead of that, they communicate by clattering their bills. And to make more impression on maybe uh, other storks or intruders, they turn their head backwards and they clatter. They spread their wings and their tail to make a big impression. They are not really um, loyal to each other. The base of the storks is their nest. So if the female is on the nest or if the male is on the nest and they are solo and a female or a male joins, then the nest is the base. So, especially when it's migration time and the male usually returns a bit earlier to the nest and when there is another female joining him and he is attracted to this female, then he mates with her. But we've also seen a lot of fight that when the original wife comes back that she manages to um, claim back this nest. This can result in heavy, heavy fights. The storks usually start clattering when another stork is in the air. You can see that they can even clatter in the air when flying. Usually it's enough for an intruder to just go away because he does not want to get hurt. But sometimes the intruder just lands on the nest and then it can result in heavy fights and especially when the birds are uh, stagging into each other with their bills it can be a bloody scene and especially on these white feathers it can look pretty pretty severe both male and female take care of the nest so it's not just the male or just the female who makes the nest, but both work to get the nest ready for the season. They do not build a new nest. Once the storks have a nest, they just keep the nest. They clean up a little bit, but every, every time, every year, a new pile of nesting material is brought on the nest. So you can see that it's growing and growing. It does not look very comfortable, all these uh, branches, but in the middle there's a little bed, a little crib for the chicks to be in. These chicks are just out of the egg, they're just a few days old. As I told you, here in the Netherlands, in March, the storks are um, mating. We do not have eggs yet, and we do not have chicks yet. That will be a bit later. The storks, the, they lay their eggs every other day, so you can see a difference in age of chicks. You can see it here on the photo. These chicks are about two weeks old, the youngest one, but you can see that the chick that hatched earlier is a lot bigger. When there are about four or five weeks and they can stand on the nest, but they still have their downy feathers. And when they grow a bit more, these are eight weeks old storks and they are almost as big as their parents. You can tell them apart that the stork, that the adult stork has a um, red bill 
and the young one has the black bill because if it grows a bit more it's difficult to see from the posture which one is the young and which one is the adult bird so just look at the bill and that makes the difference well, to grow this fast, there is a lot of food necessary. And the food is not um, divided among the young. Among the young, the storks, they return to the nest and they regurgitate the food and the storks has to have to pick up their own food. And that's where you see that when the chicks who are the strongest get the, get the food first, first come, first served. The prey that the storks bring are very small and I will show you in the next slide what the menu is. Usually this menu um, already has a lot of uh, water in the prey so it's not really necessary for the storks to bring water to the young but when it's very hot it's, it's better for the young to for example, cool down, and that's what the stork is doing on the right uh, photo. It's like giving the stork a shower to cool down. The menu of the stork. You might think that this very big bird eats a lot of big prey, but it's not the case. The main uh, food source for especially young storks are earthworms, because they have a lot of protein. Also, bugs and um, mice. And how do we know what the stork eats? Well, it, we observe it in the field. But the best way is to find the pellets. The food that the stork cannot digest is found in pellets. You can see these small beetle uh, leftovers in the pellet of the stork. We also find small bones of, for example, mice. And the stork has to depend on a good eyesight. They look for their prey, but they're also very keen and very opportunistic when there is food somewhere. Especially when the farmer is working the land, the storks, they recognize the machinery and they know when the machinery is in the field that it will stir up uh, bugs, worms, but of course also a lot of um, animals get hurt or get wounded by um, working on the land. And scavenger st stork cleans up after the machines. As I told you, they are very opportunistic and a lot of storks, they find their food on waste. Especially in Spain, there are still a lot of open dumps and on migration, the storks go there to have a meal. You can imagine that it's uh, a place where there are a lot of um, flies, mice, rats, but also human waste leftovers. So they're not very picky. They just go where there is food abundance. And when they had enough food, they're about nine to 10 weeks old. They start and practice their flight exercise. They do not leave the nest immediately. It takes about one or two weeks to get strong and to get the confidence and to practice. And then it's time for them to leave the nest. But they will return every night to sleep and to get fat. But it will gradually, but gradually they will become more independent. And finally, there's the time to go and leave the nests. Then there are a lot of dangers and there are a lot of things that they have to discover, like that you're not a duck, so that you have to um, avoid water. They walk on the roads and they go and uh, forage. They go and forage together, and this is a very um, dangerous time, especially in the city. When they are um, when they left the nest and it's um, autumn, 
then it's time for the storks to migrate. From the ring research we do, we know that almost all young chicks go on migration because there's no need for them to stay. They are not uh, able to reproduce yet. So they go on this journey. For the adult population, it's, it's somehow a dilemma. Some adult storks, they stay on the nest. And that has an advantage that you do not have to make this dangerous journey and you are able to defend your nest. So when it is spring, you are already on your nest and you, uh, there's n there is not um, a lot of chance that somebody else steals your nest. But when you migrate and you're not back on time, then there's the risk that when you return, there's somebody else another stork on your nest. About 60% of the storks, adult storks, they migrate. And we see from the ring research that it's different. Sometimes an adult stork stays during winter and maybe one year later it migrates. So it's not um, when one stork, uh, adult stork is on a nest and it does not migrate that it's always on a nest. It can differ from year to year. But all the young, young storks, they go and they make their way south. Here in Europe, we have two different routes. The storks from the Netherlands, they follow the western route. And the storks more from Germany, from the east, they follow the eastern route. And that is because the stork is highly dependent on uh, thermal lifts. It needs to soar and over land there are thermals, but over the sea there are not th no thermals. So, so the stork they look for a place where there is not enough, where there is uh, a lot of land, and there uh, the the crossing between the sea and the land is very short. When they winter. Uh, you can see that they winter uh, at the places where there are former stork uh, stations that are the places where the reintroduction program was but also you see that it's uh, in areas where it's wet near rivers but how do we know where the stork migrates to well that's an interesting story because in 1822 in germany a stork was found with a spear through his neck. And they were quite intrigued because the spear was not made in Europe. This spear, this was a spear from Africa. So then the researchers were starting and thinking, well, maybe the stork has been to Africa and there are more uh, storks like this with these spears found. So that's when uh, people um, started to think about maybe the birds do not disappear, but they migrate to another place. Well, nowadays it's more easy because of bird ringing. So we mark the individual and we can see where the bird goes to. We have recoveries from uh, for example, France and Spain. And for example, in Belgium, there is a, a project with um, GPS taggers. So you can literally follow the stork with your mobile phone. I was very uh, interested in the storks in The Hague. And that was because a lot of people told me that they uh, think that the storks in The Hague are not wild, but they are like zoo animals because they never leave the city. You always see them here. The other complaint was that there are too many storks and too many nests and too many chicks because nowadays we see a lot of storks. And I was interested, is this true? Do they stay? Do all storks stay during the winter? And are these pairs a pair for life? 
And what about the chicks that are born in the city? Will they all return to the city to breed? And is that the reason why we see so many storks? And do they also choose the same nests? If a chick is born on a chimney, will it return to the Hague and also claim a chimney? And what is the survival rate of the storks? That's why I started a ringing project uh, about uh, 11 years ago. And I will take you through the results of this ringing project. But first, when you want to ring a stork, how do you do that? The nest is high. Are the storks dangerous? Well, we will have to find out. First, it's important the age of the chicks, because when they are too big, too big, then there's the risk that they fly off the nest. And when they are too small, the ring does not fit the leg. When you go and you ring the storks, of course, you have to manage the safety and the weather. It's quite a project to um, start, because when you want to ring a stork, the stork nest is often on a landowner uh, the landowner you have to um, ask the permission to ring the storks um, also uh, the, the, the storks on the chimney you have to make sure that you have all the permissions to reach the nest it also attracts a lot of public so you have to uh, be able to tell the people what you are doing because uh, one of the first times that we tried to ring the storks people called the police and they were telling that somebody was trying to steal storks from the nest so we learned from that and nowadays we uh, inform the public that we uh, do have good intentions that we ring the storks and that we take them back to the nest also because of the height we need an aerial work platform or a mountaineer to help to ring the chicks. Well, this is when you reach a stork nest. And they are not dangerous at all. Because when there is danger, the storks go into so-called akinese. That is that they play dead, they lower their heart rate and they do this when there is danger so not just when we ring the birds but also when there is uh, maybe a big um uh, how you call it roofvogel <laughs> uh, when there is uh, a, a buzzard or um, a big bird that might have uh, interest in eating a stork chick they play that and a lot of predators they do not eat dead birds so they see this on the nest they hover over it and they think hmm a, a bunch of dead birds i'm not interested and they just fly off also for the birds themselves it's best to lower their heart rate and to keep calm you can also see from the uh, area around the nest that they keep their own crib clean and the poo is done over the nest. Also, when we take the storks out of the nest for a brief moment to do our measurements and to ring the storks, you can see that they still play dead. There is in the Netherlands uh, a standard for all young chicks. We take the same measurements so we can compare our data we look at the their feathers and we look at their health and then they get the ring with a unique number and the letters nla stand for the netherlands we depend on recoveries uh, people uh, birders that maybe uh, watch the stork with the telescope or they take a photograph and in the database, they uh, sent us a recovery of the stork. Um, they um, give their observation through the website of the um, ringing station. 
and that's when we know where the stores are. Well, the first year I rang, uh, I was ringing the stores. I thought, well, this is very, very interesting to do. And I was, of course, after my first ringing, uh, ringing job, very interested in the first nest. And it was a bit of a disappointment because the first stork that left the nest, there were three young birds on the nest. So you would say a lot of storks, like uh, a lot of people say. But the first bird, they, it was, uh, he was a victim of uh, a car cra um, uh, um, collision with a car. So unfortunately, one of the three birds died. Unfortunately, the second one had a collision with an uh, electricity uh, wire. So mm, there the second bird died. I was happy that the last, the third bird, made it to France. But unfortunately, he was uh, on an electricity pole and electrocuted. So then I had uh, kind of the proof that it's not the case that all storks, that when you see a stork nest with three healthy chicks, you can say it's a success. The danger starts when these birds leave the nest. You can see the information about the ringing that we uh, ringed a lot of uh, chicks here in The Hague. It's not necessary to ring them all, but to have a good uh, overview of the data, we tried to ring as much as possible in these 12 years. Um, there are quite a lot of recoveries, and that's because uh, in areas like uh, Spain, uh, there are a lot of birders who help us with ring reading on, for example, these uh, dumps and these waste dumps. They do not read the rings of the storks only, but there are also a lot of seagulls migrating. So there are a lot of active birders who um, go out and try to find as many ringed birds. We have recoveries from uh, Spain, France, Belgium, that's the migrating route. And uh, there is a very uh, nice sighting that one of the The Hague white storks made it to Morocco. I think it's quite special that these young birds just leave the nests. They do not follow their parents, they just go and migrate, so there must be some kind of navigation in their heads. They know where to get, where to go to, and they just spread their wings and fly from Belgium, France to Spain, and some even cross the middle of the sea and go to Morocco. As you can see, that there uh, is a lot of danger, uh, not just in the city, but also on their way. Uh, there is, for example, also still uh, people who are uh, active hunters in France, so the, still, the storks are still hunted. Let's have a look at some of the recoveries we had, because one of the questions was, if a young stork is born and raised in The Hague city, does it return to The Hague? Well, no. This stork went to a completely different place, to Middelburg. It was raised on a chimney and it is now breeding, as you can see on the picture on the right, that is now breeding on a platform. Another example of the young stork is this one. This one indeed returned to The Hague also on a chimney nest. So you can see that there's two sides, some storks, they just go back to the Hague to nest, but not all of them. And this is one of the most beautiful places, it's in Wassenaar, and these, this young stork 
uh, was born on this beautiful uh, monument. But when it was uh, grown, it chose a tree nest. And it did not uh, stay loyal to its partner and the nest. But this year it decided to change partners and change nest and it chose for a platform. The ringing project was not just the ringing and getting a lot of data, but it turned out that it's also teamwork and that we could give some advice, that we could do some promotion and it had to do with rescue. And I will take you through these points now. This is the first example, the example of the teamwork. Because these storks, they nest very high. And I was looking for a company who could help me reach this nest. But it was quite expensive to hire an aerial work platform. So I turned to the fire department. It was just a small question. I ring storks for research and maybe are you interested in helping me ringing these young storks? And I was quite surprised that they are very, very enthusiastic, especially after the first time that we ring, uh, ringed these storks because it was the case that the fire truck could not reach the area. So for them, it was a good training to see where there are hiccups when there's a true um, emergency that they can already prepare to make sure that they can reach the building. We also discovered that some roofs were not, um, not safe. So, now when it's time to ring the chicks they are very interested to help me because it's a training for them also when they have to uh, rescue birds in uh, in, in case of emergency they now know how to handle young storks the other part of the ringing is that i came into contact with people who are not really a fan of the storks and that's because they like to make their nest on this chimney but the nest goes big grows bigger and bigger and higher and higher and eventually the chimney is um, covered with all these branches and when it's winter and people want to turn on their heat it does not work so people came to me and said, well, we do not look like these storks because we uh, have problems with our heating system. Then we asked ourselves, what we can we do to help these people, but also to protect the storks' nests? Because legally, once a stork nests, it's protected and you cannot remove it. So here you can see that we um, um, altered the chimney and the storks approved. They are having a nice and warm nest and the heating system of this building still works. Another example of the chimney is that we made our own platforms. So it's still possible to use the chimney and the stork can nest there. We do not place these platforms randomly but only when a stork is nesting on this place and there's a malfunction of the chimney. Another um, advantage of the ringing is that we can promote our um, bird life, uh, the Netherlands and bird life, The Hague. Because the stork is very visible, I try uh, to promote the stork and their life. There is a film in the making. Um, there are a lot of uh, interviews about the storks. And of course, I take people on excursions to learn them more about nature and birding. And finally, rescue. 
when the young stork leaves the nest too early and we have to return it to the nest, we can look at the ring and see where the bird is from. And uh, one example of uh, the rescue is that we had a stork pair in The Hague and they were very eager to build their nest and they did not look at the area, they did not look at the traffic. So we had this sign made for the traffic to mind the storks. And I was not really prepared for the, um, uh, yeah, for the enthusiast reactions that uh, people were very interested in this sign because it was the first in the Netherlands and a lot of people came to take pictures of the sign. And I already, I was very happy because I could tell them more about the storks and the life and the nature of the Hague. A lot of rescues are done when the stork leave their nest and they go to the stork hospital and by looking at the ring we can return the chick back to the nest. This is a place where I have worked for a few years and it's very dear to me because it is the stork station this is one of the places where the storks uh, were reintroduced when I was a little girl. And it was a dream to, that came true for me that when I was grown, uh, I was able to work as a volunteer at this station. It is called the Lokerij. It is run by Els and Fritz Koopman. Unfortunately, Els passed away a few weeks ago. But Fritz is still going strong and he is looking after his storks. You can see that this reintroduction program started in 1969 and it was a huge success also because the habitat was improved and it was forbidden to use the pesticide DDT. In 1995, the breeding project ended and the main focus was to keep the habitat of the stork up to date. And the Lokerij is now a more of an education center. When I worked there, it was also a stork hospital. And storks were brought in, especially young storks. Because it's not a nice story, but when the storks see one of their chicks is weak and they do not have enough food to feed the other chicks, then they choose the weak chick sometimes and they throw it out of the nest. When it is found and it's still alive, you can bring it to the stork hospital and most of the chicks we get um we get uh, we get them to heal and they uh, are able to fly and to fledge also it can be just an accident that a chick falls down from the nest especially when they crawl for food and uh, also around the area of the stork station we had the case that parents of the nest died and that ringed adult birds were found near the nest and that we noticed that there are chicks still in the nest helpless and we were able to rescue these chicks. Then when the breeding season is almost ended and the chicks fly off then we first then we get the first uh, fledglings uh, and they are often weakened after their first flight, they have to discover the traffic, water, high buildings, and they are brought to this stork hospital. I promised you a look behind the scenes. And when you work at the stork station, it's multitasking because it's not just working with the storks, but we also make nest platforms and re rescue storks on the way. 
Of course, I promised you some photos of stork chicks because I know that a lot of people from especially South Africa, they see these migrating birds, but they have never seen a stork chick. And these pictures are all, 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 were, uh, uh, were all taken at the stork hospital. This is the stork just out of the egg and we try to rescue it. And you see that the uh, main food source of the stork is meat. And uh, it was a bit difficult for me as vegetarian to uh, cut all these meats for these storks. But I do it with uh, pleasure to rescue them. This stork is a little bit bigger, but you can see it's still quite young because there is this egg tooth on the end of the bill it's the tooth that most mo that most birds have and they use it to get out of the egg to open the shell when the bird gets a bit bigger you can see here that it tries to stand it looks more like a chicken but a few days later they grow bigger and bigger and so when storks are brought to the stork hospital, we try to reunite them with other storks. We try to bring the storks together because the stork lads, the young storks, they grow on a grow on a nest with other with their brothers and sisters. So you can also uh, bring young storklets from different nests and bring them into one nest. Here you can see three different storks from different nests and they grow up together just like brothers and sisters in the wild. And then we get this first fledgling leaving the nest and walking around. And new storks, they come in because these are the fledglings who got into trouble with traffic and high buildings and the main reason why they are brought into this hospital is because of a pellet obstruction and that is because there are a lot of meals that the storks get from their parents like rubber bands and plastic when there is not enough food available the stork adults they want to raise their chicks and they just give them anything that they can get their hands on and sometimes it looks like their prey for example uh, these little black stones they look like bugs and the rubber bands look like earthworms so when a stork is brought in we give them some laxative and it usually results in a lot of big pellets these two pellets weigh half a kilo so can you can you can imagine that the bird is very relieved that it lost these pellets and it can eat again. Here you can see the storks, young storks, because they have their black bills, like in a five-star hotel, waiting for their meal. And just like in nature, we just we do not present each stork their food, but it's brought in a bowl and they have to pick their own food. It's not really necessary to water them like the storks on the nest. We spray them with a little water when it's very hot. But you can see from this big bill, this stork is almost ready to leave the nest. Then they go to another area in the stork hospital where they can socialize with wild storks outside. And finally, it's time to open the door and they fly into the world and they become totally independent. Here you can also see that we ring the storks and that we have a lot of recovery so that we know that when a young stork is brought in, it is valuable to rescue it and it becomes totally independent.
it just flies off and for me this is a magic moment also with some tears because you took care of this bird for 10 weeks and then it leaves and you have to wait is there a recovery is it a recovery of a dead bird or is it the recovery of a living bird and maybe after a few years it will return and i will see it again from the stork hospital we have some examples and the first one is this bird brought in as a little chick and made it to spain to winter and migrate to winter there the storks they are able to reproduce when they are over two years and three years old and in the meantime they just soar around and usually they return to the country that they were born in but it's not that they choose the same nesting spots like a chimney or a platform they make their own choice here is the one with the big pellet you might think hmm, what is what is happening to these birds when it flies off because it's used to be fed by humans but you can and it, it migrates and eventually it will return and make its own nest. Well, this is the view uh, of the white stork in the Netherlands. And you can see that I also use the ringing of the storks to make new stork fans and to tell people about birds and nature. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And if there are any questions, just put them in the chat box. Thanks, Caroline. That was absolutely fascinating. I really enjoyed that. You can see with all the clapping, a lot of people enjoyed it as well. I have to turn, I will turn on the light because I'm in the yeah. dark. <laughs> see, you're sitting in the dark now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At this okay. moment, I'm working with parrots here in the Netherlands. So I'm staying not at home, but in a small cabin. And I just found out that I was in the dark all the time again. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. We, your voice was very clear. Okay. Your That's presentation good. was great. Yeah, it's, it's, I had to get a bit used to, because usually I give a presentation and I see the audience and now it's just the screen and I wonder, <laughs> no, it was excellent. Okay, we can start with the questions. I see David asks, and I'm not sure if you answered that question. You did talk about it. Do the nests in chimneys cause fires? Uh, no, we uh, until now it has not caused fires, only just malfunction of the chimney and the installations. So luckily no fires. But it's also, it's, it is a risk, so uh, that's yeah. why we built these platforms, so the storks can nest there safely. I'm sure the birds must get nice and warm with all that. Yes, it is warm, warm because yeah, warm. yeah, yeah, because we go on the roofs with a group of volunteers to yeah. um, uh, get this platform on the chimney, and yeah. it's usually not in the breeding season, so it's usually in winter. And it was very cold, but when we are on these chimney, it was very hot. Yeah, yeah. these storks, yeah, they uh, they choose the chimneys uh, also probably because it's has because of its view, they can yeah. look at the foraging uh, area, but it might also be interesting for them because it's warm. Yes, yeah. Um, I just commented as well, um, we see them here in Southern Africa and they're very quiet and they're very placid and they don't open their mouths <laughs> and no. make any noise. No. But to see how aggressive they are on their yeah. breathing site is quite an yeah. eye opener. Yes, yes, they are. The nest is, is, is very important because they built one nest and they have to keep it. It's not like mm. other birds that they just use a nest and next time or next breeding season, they build a new one. No, they just have to keep their nest and they're very keen because it's, yeah, 
it's difficult to find a new place to nest. And that's why it's also very attractive for other storks. Because once you, you have these nests, other storks, they want it because they know it's a safe place. It's probably in the area where I can forage. So they are very keen to steal the nests from each other, especially in the start of the breeding season. They can be very, very uh, fightive, fighting. What, um, was there a project where the people were encouraged to install poles? Yes, it was in the beginning when uh, the storks were not doing very well. Mm -hmm. We now have around uh, 1,600 breeding pairs. But when I was a little kid, the storks were extinct. So everything was done to um, make sure that the storks would return. So the habitat was improved. It was not allowed to use uh, dangerous pesticides. Yeah. And people were uh, asked, well, just make a place for the storks yeah. to nest. So on chimneys and on uh, artificial uh, nesting platforms. But nowadays, the storks also nest in trees, so mm. it's not really necessary to make these artificial platforms. Yes, anymore. yes. Uh, that's interesting. Yes. So they, they're going back to what they should be doing. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Project Energy, I'm not sure what your real name is, asks, how can we partner to start to conserve the storks? I think he's from Lesotho, if I... Yes, from Lesotho. Well, that's a very good question, and that's also um, why, with the knowledge we have now, I'm not quite sure if we would re be, if we would uh, start a reintroduction program, because the base is the habitat to keep yeah. the habitat of the birds intact, so the birds can forage and they have a safe place to nest. So it all starts with a good habitat yeah and also uh to um look at our waste production because we also see that a lot of storks but also other birds for example they eat plastic or they feed the plastic and waste to their chicks so that's that are two things to keep in mind the habitat and the waste we reproduce Yes, in my province, of, we found a place where the abattoir was throwing away bits of meat. I mean, like in large quantities. And the storks act actually stayed in overwintered yeah. know, in South Africa because there was such a large um, meat supply. Yeah, because as they are very opportunistic and they have to find their food yes. somewhere. So when there is a, a place like that, they they know it and they go there and uh, they uh, they scavenge, they scavengers. So uh. yeah, and Project Energy was wanting your contact details, um, Caroline. So maybe after this chat session, you can type in your email address in the <laughs> chat box and and yeah, um, they can take it from there. Um, Paolo asks, at what age or weeks do you ban storks? They are, yeah, they are between the four and five weeks old. And that's um, mm -hmm. the leg of the stork is big enough for the ring. And the storklets are not as, as big that they leave the nest and they, they, they can fly off. They still have these uh, akinase. They still have this um, automatic reaction that when there is danger, they just pretend to be dead. Mm -hmm. And when they're about five, six weeks old, it disappears and they also start to defend themselves. Oh, okay. yeah, that's interesting. Rosemary asks, what is their life expectancy? Um, in the oh. wild, in the wild, it's about twenty years. Oh but wow! We, yeah, but we have a, a old stork in the stork station, and mm -hmm. it was thirty-two years old. Ooh. Yeah, and also oh. in zoos, yeah. that's the area. That's the age that the storks can reach. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, so they have a very long lifespan. But the once they leave the nest as chick. 
and mm. they are um, safe from all these dangers when they manage to survive that that's when they can get very old but most yeah. storks the dangerous period is when they leave the nest that a lot of storks they do yeah they do not survive their first year yeah but it's it's the same with another uh, a lot of other migrant birds mm. that the dangers on the way get, yeah makes makes a lot of casualties yeah yes i think with all migratory birds you know if the weather yeah. changes suddenly or, or yeah. something yeah. yeah especially now also with these uh, uh climate change uh, and also still a lot of hunting especially in the yeah. middle east so uh, they have hard. to overcome a lot of dangers to uh i thought that yeah. hunting was stopped um no it's unfortunately not there are still a lot of areas where there is a, a very active hunting uh oh that's not good uh, yeah no that's not good no and it's not just it's not for food i can imagine that when you live in africa and you uh, mm. do not have mm. any food and you live uh, somewhere in the outback and mm. that you eat these animals but the hunt the hunting i'm talking about is just for pleasure that's terrible you yeah. know in this day and age you think people would be more enlightened i thought they'd stop that yeah no now it just it it goes from uh, father to son because it's like a tradition, yeah. and sure. also yeah. yeah, also when we tell these kinds of stories, um, it might also uh, ring a yeah, does ring a bell with these people that they might think of other ways to um, yeah to 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 to, or to stop this hunting. There are a lot yeah. of eco projects that when that they leave the birds alone and that they start these eco projects that tourists yeah. can come in to take pictures of the birds yeah. and they organize excursions so there might be a change in the future well let's hope yes yeah. it's so unnecessary just shooting for fun you know and not eating the birds yeah. just shooting it for fun okay sen is asked could you share the average size and weight of the pellets with me just to compare to my own research over in yeah. the UK. Yes, I have her details and I will give her some more information about the pellets. I have some photographs and some more information. I have her details, so I will email her with these details. Yeah. Um, Dory's posted something in Dutch. Um, I can only speak Afrikaans, so I can't read that. Um, maybe you can read it. It's fantastic. Oh, maybe it's fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic the way I explained it. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and Catherine Dempsey says, I live in Europe. When I was a child back in 1959 to 63, we loved the stork nests on chimneys in France and the Netherlands. I was yeah. only six years old. Yeah. Yeah. In the Netherlands, they were uh, almost extinct, like extinct. And it was different in France. So, uh, uh, yeah. Were there still some in France then? Or? There were still some in France and in Swiss and in Spain. And yeah. these storks were used for the reintroduction program. Oh, in okay. yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever had any of your storks come to Southern Africa? No, I have not. And that's yeah. not really a surprise because yeah. the storks in the Netherlands, they take the Western route. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the uh, fur the furthest recovery I had is from uh, Morocco, okay. and the storks that breed more east, like in Germany, they follow uh, the eastern route and they go all the way to South Africa. So, but it just, is, yeah, yeah, I must check. There was one that died near someone's land, you know, ag agricultural land last year and i'm not sure where it was ringed but they did find out where it was ringed oh that's great yeah, yeah i'll send you a message yeah, yeah. most most likely I'll somewhere in the east yeah it was yes but i, I can't remember now i'll have to look up yeah. 
een geweldige presentatie, Caroline. Ja, so maybe you can, yeah, you can read it because it's all a bit of uh, Afrikaans. Like Afrikaans, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Roger asks how long the transmitter stays live. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, we, we, we do not, uh, I do not have the experience with the transmitters, but I know that they have a long life because they use a solar, solar to get their battery charged. Okay. So uh, I, it, it's, um, I think it can last for years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, if it's solar powered. Tom yeah. asks, are the small rock in the stomach akin to gastroliths in reptiles to help grind the food if they eat no. tiny stones no that's not the case for the storks the small rocks they just come when they forage by mm. accident mm. and if there is not enough food and the storks had adults they have chicks they want to give their chicks yeah. some kind of food and then they just mm. pick up rocks and glass and rubber yeah. bands just to uh, make sure that their chicks are fat and they are quiet. But yeah, you cannot grow very old or you cannot grow very big on uh, waste and stones. So uh, these small rocks in the stomach, that's usually the case for parrots. They need it to digest their seeds. And the yeah. stomach, they do not eat seeds, but they eat mostly flesh. So it's not necessary for them to eat small rocks to uh, to help uh, grind the food. Yeah. Grind the food, yeah. yeah. Rosemary asks, did they not install wheels on roofs? I presume she means tires as a basis for nests, or was that just a story? No, they, uh, no. People were very interested, especially uh, when the storks were almost extinct, um, because uh, the stork is also the symbol for luck. So a lot of uh, farmers, they were, uh, uh, they brought, they uh, installed these platforms on their house, because when a stork would nest there, it meant that the farm is safe. Okay. It's a part of the symbolism that uh, the stork stands for luck. So uh, it was people were very interested in having them on their roofs. But nowadays, people uh, mostly complain about birds because they make a lot of noise or they the <laughs> poo. So, uh, but in, oh, yeah. in the old days, they were more interested in the storks because they brought a lot of luck. Yeah, we have that with. Errands in my part of the world, they nest in people's gardens or yeah. trees on the pavements, and people don't like the noise and they don't like the smell yeah. and the food yeah, and yeah. All that. We, have, we have the same with like the Egyptian geese and the yeah. snowballs yeah. who nest because a lot of habitat is lost. So you see yeah. that a lot of birds are um, yeah. coming into the city for food and for a safe nesting place because there's nowhere else to go for them. And I don't know if it's Jean, Jean or Jean um, says in Dutch, thanks for the mm. lovely presentation. Greetings from the OI team. The OI, OI team. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's the team in Belgium. Yes. I really yeah. like that a lot of star friends joined this presentation. Yeah. 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 Are there any more questions before we wrap up? Oh, that was a very good talk and many, many questions, which shows people were very interested. And I'll type in my... Your email address. Your address. I am also active on Facebook and yes. LinkedIn. Yeah. So people can find me there. Yeah. Okay, lots of thank yous from people. And just before we wrap up, um, on the 21st is another presentation by Jess Lund. When perfection isn't enough, how Forktail Drongo's egg signatures defend against near-perfect African cuckoo mimicry. So if you're interested in that, please join. Please also spread the word about these webinars to your birding friends, and it'll be nice to um, grow these this group it's yeah. 
going very well. So yeah, spread yeah. it. Now, thanks, Derek. Derek has typed that into the comment section. You can yeah. read yeah. it there. Thanks. Are there any more questions? I think everyone's finished. Thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I think that's about all. Thanks, everybody. Um, oh, hope thank you very um, much. See you on the 21st again for the next webinar. Um, happy birding. Happy Bye. birding. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.